Hi and welcome to another episode of Reaper TV. In today's video we're going to be taking a look at 5 more power tips to speed up your process of working with Reaper and just improve your productivity and workflow. So let's start off with the first tip right now. Now I'm sure many of you have a shortcut to start in Reaper, but did you know that you can actually start Reaper up in various different modes? So say for example, you just want to start it up without actually opening up the last project and you forgot to close that project down, but you don't want to go through the process of waiting for that project to load up and loading all the VSTs. If you come down to the start, and we go up to all programs in this instance, and we go to the folder of this Reaper and we click, you can see we have a range of different options. And obviously we can create shortcuts for any of these. But what we can do is we can start Reaper like we normally would, or we can click and create a new project. So we click on that. That will automatically open Reaper up with a blank new project ready for us to start working. We can also come down and we can start it up in various other ways. So if we come back up to Reaper, we can also do this where we can reset the configuration to factory defaults which obviously I would recommend being very careful with that because the last thing you want to do is a pile of customization and then you find you click on that and all of that's wiped out. So make sure you've always got a backup. I've got a video for that, which I'll link in the description below just to make sure you've always got an up-to-date backup of all the changes and settings you have set up in Reaper. But that's there if you find that something's happened to your configuration and you need to start off completely clean. You can also do show audio configuration on start time. So we click on that. That will open up Reaper and automatically open up the preferences. So this is a great way of setting up Reaper so you can start it up in various different modes without having to go through the process of starting it up with a previous project already open. So in this example, I'm going to show you a couple of tricks when working with MIDI. So I've got a drum track that uses Easy Drummer 2. So I'm just going to open that up and you can see it's a pretty typical looking MIDI layout. I've got my drum set up and as you can see at the moment I don't have any drum names on there which could make it a little bit confusing. Now this is not limited to drums, this can be with any kind of MIDI software that you're working with, any VST. You can customize the note names. Now you may find that if you're using something like Easy Drummer and a particular Easy X you can download this but you're not limited to that, you can customize it in your own way. To do that there's a couple of things we can do. The easiest is if we go to any of the drum tracks, you can see that we can click and we can then listen to the, sa the sample on there. What we can also do is we can name that. Now the easiest way of doing that is to double right click on that MIDI lane. So if we double click, you can see that opens it up and allows us to then put a name in. So if we come down, we can say, well, there's my kick drum, for example. I can right click. That'll select all of them. But if I double right click, I can now name that. So I can just put kick in there. And if I want to, I can come up to the next one and I can say this is my snare. And I can go through and I can name those one at a time to get everything the way I want. I could then save that out if I want to. So if I come up to File and I choose Note Names, I have the option to say Save Note Names to File. So if I click on that, that'll take us through to the location on our drive where we can then go in and name that file. And as you can see, it saves it as a text file. So I can simply call this Easy Drummer and put the Easy X in there or any VST that I want. I can name that and then I can call that back up at any time in the future. Now these are just simple standard text files. So any text editor like Notepad can be used to lay this out quite quickly and easily. So if you know the note names and you know the note number, you can then easily do that by hand. So if we just scroll down, you can see I've got a range of ones that have been previously created. So if I take, for example, this drum forge shells, which didn't come with any mapping to it, so we didn't know what any of those names were on any of the samples. So if I just open that up, you can see I've got a simple text file on there. So as you can see, it is simply just a typical text file that has the MIDI note number and the actual note name that you want to apply to it. Now, like I say, you're not limited to being drum tracks. You can do this with any kind of virtual instrument and set anything you want up on there for any of those note names. So that's quite easy, quite useful. Now, there's something that I find very useful when I'm working with complex drum tracks. that You don't use all of the different samples that you have in any kind of given drum track. And like I say, this isn't limited to drum tracks, but for me, this is a good example. Well, 
you can see we've got lots of empty tracks on there that we're not using anything on at all. And if we've got quite a lot of different drum samples, which you can very easily get with things like Easy Drummer 2 and also with Superior Drummer, this can get quite a lot of information and you can tend to find you scrolling up and down the screen a lot. So you can see if we go down the screen, we get these little green markers telling us there's some notes that are being used below our view. We also have a lot of dead space in there. So what we can do is we can come up to the view menu and we can come down to say show hide note rows and then we have three options show all note rows, hide unused note rows and hide unused and unnamed note rows. So you can choose whichever option is applicable to you. So I'm going to go for example show so you hide unused note rows and you can see that now simplifies my interface to just showing me the rows that we are using in this particular MIDI sequence. I can call those back up at any point by simply coming back up to view, coming down to show and hide note rows and say show all note rows. So it's a great way of quickly being able to show and hide empty lanes in your MIDI information. Great for speeding up your productivity and great for just streamlining the, streamlining the interface. Now, would it be great if in Reaper we could actually adjust the parameters for any plugin on any track without having to go back into the effects section and open that particular plugin back up and then choose the parameter we want to edit? Well, Reaper being Reaper and very, very customizable, we can do that very easily. So I'm going to use the base main as an example. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull up some of the parameters that I have available to me as part of the plugin that I'm using to give the bass its sound. So if I come to the effects section and I just click on there, I'm going to choose Easy Mix from the list. And as you can see, we have the normal controls in there, your input and output and so on, and the EQ and anything else that applies this specific uh, patch that we're using. So I'm going to close that down because I don't need that to be open. I just need to make sure it's selected in the normal effects window in Reaper. And if we take a look at the top, you can see I've got the option that says Param, which is short for parameter. So I can click on that and you can see that we have an option that's available, which is effects parameter list. And you can see if we look in there, we've got quite a few different options. And the one that we are interested in for this particular example is show in track controls. Now, what I can do on there is you can see I've got shape one, shape two, output, input, bypass and wet, which apply to the different settings we can adjust inside Easy Mix itself. Now, these are going to be specific and context sensitive based upon the plugin that you're using and what's available to edit in there. But you can see we have one inherent problem with this. We've just got shape one and shape two, and that doesn't really mean anything because if you're used to using Easy Mix, that can apply to various different things. It could be EQ, gain, anything you want it to be that's specific to the patch that we're using. So let's assign this first of all, and let's take a look at how we can rename this and make it a little bit more intuitive for us to work with. So let's go through and say we'll choose shape one, which we know is the EQ. Once I've done that, if we take a look at the panel now, the actual track itself, you can see we now have shape one and we've got a rotary dial in there, which we can then use to adjust the amount of EQ that's been applied inside the Easy Mix plugin on this specific track. But as I said, shape one doesn't really mean anything. So if I just open that back up, we can see that shape one equates to EQ. So what I can do is if I come over this, I can right click and I can choose Alias VST Easy Mix to track Shape 1. So if I click on that, you can see that brings up the option to rename this. So now I can say Easy Mix and we'll say EQ. So that now makes more sense to me. So I now know what that actually relates to. As you can see, I can control that like you normally would with your normal rotary dial. And if we open up the user interface and we take a look at that, we'll see if we adjust on the interface itself, you take a look by there, it adjusts on there. And vice versa, if I adjust it on the track itself, it will adjust the amount we have applied to us. So let's just take that down and you can see everything updates in real time so we know exactly what's going on. Now the beauty of this is we're not limited to just one. If I expand this out, I can keep on adding parameters to this track for any of the plugins I have available. And the nice thing is now once we've applied it once, I don't need to go back into the effects list to go and choose what I want. I can just right click on any of these empty areas. You can see it now shows me all of the different VSTs that I've got applied to this specific track. And then I can come in and I can say I want something else. So let's just say I want to deal with the input and output. So I can say I'll set output, uh, I'll do the same again. And we'll set input and I can alias these if I want to. So I can just say easy mix. I think that was the input, yeah. And there we go, so I've renamed that. And if I want to close this down, it'll resize 
and give us more room on there so we can see exactly what we're editing. So that's a very quick and easy way of being able to assign parameters for any of your effects plugins direct to the track and then you can fine tune and tweak those all you want. You can even assign these to MIDI Learn to any MIDI device you have. So if you're using a control surface and you've got sliders and rotary dials and things, you could right click and you can say learn and then you can assign that to any control you have through that MIDI interface. Pretty cool. Now I'm all for making my life that much easier and we all kind of do very repetitive tasks in Reaper. So one of the things that I want to show you is how we can easily go in and save our own presets even for commercial add-ons that are not part of Reaper itself. So let's just take an example of Easy Mix. So I'm just going to open up my effects panel and I've got Easy Mix there in front of me. So I've got my bass guitar and everything set up. So I've got the typical sound that I like to work with. Now I want to save that out as a preset. The beauty of this is it's very, very easy. So let's just bring the default window up for Reaper for the effects panel. And as you can see, if we go to the EQ, for example, I've got a set of previous stock sort of presets that ship with Reaper itself. But if we go to Easy Mix, we've got nothing in there. We've got no presets or we've got VST Basic and so on. So nothing's really in there. But what we can do is we can come over to the little plus to the right hand side of where it says no preset and we can click on there and we can say save preset or we can say save preset as default. Difference being save preset allows us to call it back up. Save preset as default means that every time we apply an instance of easy mix it would then load that preset in and apply that straight away. That would be the default. So let's just say save preset. It allows us then to choose a name. So we're going to call this standard base sound and just click OK and that now becomes available to us. So if we click and expand you can see we've now got a user preset in there. Now if I go up and I just choose anything, just change it completely from being what it was which is the bass, bass tone. If I now come back to this and choose standard bass tone everything is set back to exactly where it was. The other beauty of this is the fact that you can save this out and share it with people. So if I wanted to I can click on the plus and I can say export preset library.rpl so I could then easily send that out export it out and then anybody who wanted to share this with that uses easy mix that has the same patches that I have loaded in they can just choose any of my presets load that in and they've got exactly the sound that they're working with based upon what I've saved it out as quick easy and a real time saver So in this final tip, we're going to take a look at how we can take two mono tracks and create a stereo track from them. This is quite easy and there's various different reasons why you might want to do this. But one of the things we need to do first of all is make sure that if we want this track to be stereo that the two original mono tracks, in this case guitar left and guitar right, are both set to be one pan left, one pan right, otherwise we're not going to get that full stereo effect. The other thing we need to make sure that we have is that we have them parented to a master track. So you can see I have Rhythm Master and Guitar Left and Guitar Right are parented through into that. If you're not sure how to do that, I'll show you that next. So I'll simply take these out of being parented. So I'll just click on the little X symbol. That will then put them back into normal tracks. Now what I can do is if I just select the tracks, and remember to include the master track as well, the parent track. So we'll just select those three tracks. And then when we want to become the parent, I'll just click on the plus symbol, which is a little folder icon that changes to the plus. Click on that. They now become child tracks. So we've now got one stereo rendition of these two tracks. If we listen to this rhythm master, we'll see that we have a stereo track there. <laughs> So as you can see, we have a stereo track, but it's still two mono tracks, and we're just listening to the parent track there. So what we can do is we can set that to become a stereo track. So if we right click, so we've now got the option to render track to stereo stem tracks and mute originals, which will then create a new track that'll be stereo, guitar pan left and right, giving us a stereo track. Obviously, you're not limited to guitars, you can use anything you want. 
If we're working with multi-track, for example, 5.1 soundtrack for audio for a film or something, we could then choose render tracks to multi-channel stem tracks and mute original. So it'll do the same thing, but it'll create a multi-track version of that and not just a stereo track. For this example, we just want render tracks to stereo stem tracks and mute originals. So we click on that. That'll go through now in faster than real time. It'll render that out and then we'll have a stereo track with the original muted so we just have the stereo track to play back. And there we go, there's our stereo track. So we can see we have that, so all the rest are muted, so we just solo that out and listen to that. We've now got a, mono, a stereo version. <laughs> We can also do the reverse of this. So let's just say, for example, we have a stereo track that we want to split into two separate mono tracks, or we've got a multi-track, like a 5.1 sound, and we've got that set up and we want to export that or explode that out to be in multi-track, we can do that as well. So all we need to do is make sure we have the media item selected. This doesn't need to be one continuous media item. If you have this sliced up, you can just double click on the track to select it, to select all the different component pieces, and then we can just go through and process this. So if I right click, and I come down to item processing, you can see we have the option that says explode multi-channel audio or MIDI items to new one channel items. So in this example, that's going to take that stereo feed and export that out to two mono feeds. So let's just do that. Let that go through and that will then export that out. And as you can see, we now end up with two tracks. And there we go. That's how easy it is. Obviously, the next thing we need to do with this is to pan this left and right, because at the moment we do with two mono feeds. So if we just solo those two tracks and we take a listen to it, you'll see they're both coming down the center. So that's how easy it is to take mono tracks and make them stereo, or take stereo tracks and make them mono. So that concludes this 5 Power Tips for Reaper video. I hope you found the tips useful. If you did, please give the video a thumbs up and hit that subscribe button to be kept up to date with all of the new content we add every single week. If you have any comments, questions or feedback on this video or anything else we cover on the channel, please pop those in the comments section below. We read everything you post and try to answer as many questions as possible. And until next time, happy mixing.